Recently, um, well, you know, I just should say this. It's Easter Sunday, and it's the Easter sermon, and all of you already presume to know what I'm going to say before I say it. <laughs> yada, 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 Jesus raised the dead, let's go have ham and eggs or whatever it is you're going to do, right? And that's one of the, it makes Easter both the, the most amazing and the most difficult time to preach because we presume to know the story, and sometimes our presumption and our familiarity gets in the way. So I'm going to ask us to sort of lay aside our, our familiarity for a minute and let God speak to us maybe in a new way about this ancient and familiar story. I read a Wall Street Journal article recently by a Jesuit priest named Father James Martin called The Challenge of Easter. And one of the observations he makes in his article is that Easter, unlike Christmas, has managed to avoid the extreme commercialization of our culture. And that's true if you think about it, isn't it? I mean, Easter's, Christian is a, Christmas is a whole thing. Starbucks has its Christmas cups in early August now. Hallmark never stops making Christmas movies, no matter what time of year it is. It's the same movie, just different titles, right? But the Hallmark doesn't have Easter movies. So it doesn't have Easter's cups. We have traditions. We have the baskets and the eggs and the bunnies. But it's just different. It's not commercialized the same way. And in the article, uh, Father Martin observes that part of the reason is that the, the core message of Easter is more difficult to tame than that of Christmas. And I think he's right. What he means is this. You know, baby Jesus, you can sentimentalize and romanticize and sanitize baby Jesus in the manger. We sing Silent Night and Away in the Manger and it's cute and cuddly. But at the heart of Easter... Is a story about a man who was betrayed by his best friends, who was falsely accused, a mockery of a trial, convicted, tortured, and executed. No wonder we had to make up bunnies for the kids. It's not the same. And if you think about that, I've been thinking about this. This is a man who claimed to be God, and we believe rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father, and is even right now reigning over all creation and interceding for us. And this week, here I am in my office trying to think about how to make this message more interesting to you. It's ridiculous if you think about it. It's the most history-shaping, world-changing, life-altering message that anyone has ever known. And yet, sometimes we dismiss it. It's the cultural thing that we do. Think of it this way. If, you, if the FedEx truck pulled up to your house and a guy ran up to your door and dropped off a big padded envelope, you know, full of papers and you weren't sure what was in there and he ran off and you went out and grabbed it and opened it up and inside you saw official looking documents from some law firm that you didn't recognize and as you read through you realized some, apparently the claim is some distant relative of yours who you never met or even heard of has left you $10 million. How many of you would be skeptical? If it was an email from a Nigerian prince, you'd be skeptical for sure, right? <laughs> You'd probably all be skeptical, thinking, how is it possible I have a relative that's worth $10 million I don't even know of, and why would they leave it to me? You'd probably have questions. How many of you would at least check it out? What? Half of you? You're lying, right? <laughs> We'd all check it out. Why? Why would you check it out? Because it's $10 million. It's too much. It's too good not to at least find out. At least make a phone call. At least, you know, just check. Because there's too much at stake. I mean, it's probably not true, but what if it is? Maybe we should think of Easter that way. The offer's too good not to investigate. Well, what's the offer of Easter? What's the, what's the offer being made to us? Eternal life? Yes. Forgiveness of sin? Absolutely. Hope of eternity? Yes. Presence of God in us and his power flowing through us right now? Yes. All things being restored, all that's wrong and corrupt and sinful and unjust being made right? Yes. 10 million times 10 million. It's too good not to explore and find out, not to investigate. So let's do that. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. In the English Standard Version, you can follow along in your own Bibles or on the screens. Every one of the four Gospels gives us an account of the resurrection. I'm just going to read these 12 verses of Luke's account. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. 
But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Each of the four gospel writers records an account of the resurrection and the empty tomb. And they all write it from their own perspective. So it's the same story told from different perspectives. For example, in John 21, John's account, he includes some interesting details. He calls himself the disciple Jesus loved. Well, really, John? You just can't say you're John? He has to point that out. And then John says that he and Peter ran to the tomb. And that Peter looked in first, but John makes a point of saying, but John got there first. He just wants you to know he's faster than Peter, apparently. <laughs> these, these interesting details, that kind of, they give us the, like, this feels like somebody's really telling us the true story here. In every account, nobody is arguing that the tomb is not empty. Think about that for a minute. In every one of the gospel accounts, there's lots of confusion and, and stories being circulating, but nobody's saying he's not in there, that he's still in there. They all acknowledge that it's empty. The women think that, the, that someone has stolen the body. They ask the men, where have you taken our Lord so we can anoint him? The Romans think the disciples stole the body. The disciples, as usual, are confused, don't know what to think. But nobody's saying he's still there. They're all trying to figure out what has happened. Now, stop and consider the significance of that fact for a minute. There were a lot of powerful, influential people in first century uh, Jerusalem and Rome and the high priests and the Jewish leaders, who had a vested interest in making sure that Jesus stayed dead. If the resurrection was just rumor, and when the rumor started, what's the easiest way to stop the whole thing? Show the body. Nobody does that. Nobody did that. Nobody could do that. They're all trying to come up with an explanation, but nobody produces a corpse. Nobody argues the tomb is not empty. All four gospel accounts also agree that it was women who were the first to witness the empty tomb and the risen Jesus. That might not strike us as odd or strange, but it would be in the first century. It seems appropriate to us. But this women who are the very first ones to see the tomb is empty, to see the risen Jesus, and to go and tell about this news. So women were the first to witness the resurrection and to be the first evangelists, to proclaim it. And who do they proclaim it to? Who are the first people to receive the news? Women, and then who do they tell? The disciples, the men. Women have to tell the men what's going on. <laughs> and what's the men's reaction? Idle tales. The women are crazy. You can't believe them. I didn't, that's just what the Bible says. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Here's the point. Uh, um, Pagan philosopher uh, in, the, in about 180 AD named Celsus, who was no friend of Christianity, was a critic of Christianity, thought it was a blight on, on the Roman Empire, wrote a critique of Christianity. One of his central arguments against Christianity is that the whole thing hangs on the resurrection, and the resurrection relies on the witnesses of women who, as we all know, are quite hysterical. His words, not mine. The point is, if you were going to invent a story or rewrite history to prop up your narrative, you would never do it this way in the first century. Never. But yet there it is. And some people today think that, you know, the ancient people, they were, they were kind of more credulous than us, easy to believe these things. But we're, we're modern, rational people. We need evidence. If we're going to take the claims of the resurrection seriously, then we have to take the claims of the Gospels seriously. Here's what C.S. Lewis writes about these. And you might know C.S. Lewis from... Well, the fact that I quote him all the time. Or the Chronicles of Narnia or Mere Christianity. But he was trained and he was a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature. He was an expert in romance, myth, story, legends of the Renaissance and ancient world. Here's what he writes. I've been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. And I know what they are like. I know that none of them is like this, meaning the New Testament Gospels. Of this text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, pretty close up to the facts, or else some unknown writer in the second century without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern, novelistic, realistic narrative. If it is untrue, it must be narrative of this kind. The reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned to read. You hear what he's saying? You, you buy a novel today, or historical fiction, I love to read historical fiction, 
And the authors are telling a story that's not true, but they put it in a setting that's real, and they add all kinds of details to make us feel as if it's real. You, right? You've read these? That's, that's normal today. That did not exist in the ancient world. Nobody wrote that way. They either wrote eyewitness accounts or myths and legends of a very different kind. And Lewis is pointing this out as a scholar trained to notice. So if we're going to take seriously the message of Easter, we have to take seriously the message in the, of the Gospels. As I said, some people today, I, and I hear this all the time, think, well, you know, Christians, you just decide to have faith. It's like a blind leap. It's not, you have to kind of check your mind at the door. It's not rational. It's not reasonable. It's this leap of faith. And I'm a reasonable, rational person, and, you know, and I, I just can't make that leap. As if somehow reason and rational thought are over here, and faith is over here, and they're diametrically opposed. You know, in, in John's Gospel, when he gives an account, he says that Peter went in and saw. And he doesn't use the Greek word blepo, meaning seeing with your eyes. He uses a different word where we get our English word theorize from. It literally means to think out the implications. So in other words, Peter and John are in the tomb, and they're looking at the, the grave clothes. And they're thinking, what is going on? They're using their reason. No grave robbers would undress the body and leave these laying here. That doesn't make any sense. And his face cloth is folded separately. And the, who moves the stone? They're rationally thinking out the implications of what they are seeing and what they're being told. And the gospel accounts show us that it actually took a great deal of evidence for people to believe the resurrection in the first century. We tend to think that those people were credulous and they just, you know, superstitious. Not so. They had to believe based on evidence and thought. Nobody was predisposed to believe it. Do you know what the women say? Where have you taken him? They don't understand. It doesn't make sense to them. Jesus actually has to appear to Mary and call her by name before she gets it. And then they go to the disciples and they tell the disciples what they have seen. What is their reaction? Pfft, I don't talk. This doesn't make any sense. It, people, the first century believers and the 21st century believers believe based on evidence. Here's the point. Christian faith is more than just reason and rational thought, but it is not less than that. It goes beyond it. You know what else is telling about the gospel accounts? It's the fact that nobody seemed to anticipate it. Do you ever notice that when you read through the stories? Nobody thought it, saw it was coming. Do you remember when the angels say to the women, just as he told you when he was in Galilee, that the Son of Man will be betrayed in the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise? They're repeating something Jesus said over and over and over again in the gospels. The Son of Man will be betrayed in the hands of sinful men on the third day rise. On the third day, I'll rise from the dead. I'm going to die, but on the third day, I'm going to rise. At one point, Peter says to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, stop talking about your death so much. It's bad for morale. That's my translation. He doesn't put it that way. And Jesus says what to him? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, nobody had any category for a God who dies and rises again. It just didn't make any sense to them. And despite the fact that Jesus says it over and over and over again, the third day I will rise. Not one of them went, you know what? It is day three. Maybe we should just check. You know, probably not, but it couldn't hurt. Let's go check. They don't. The women who went to the tomb weren't looking for a risen Savior. They're looking for a corpse to tend to. This brings us to the first of two observations I want to make and then one application of this story and this is a critical question, a critical question that, I, that the angels ask the women, and I think God asks us today, even still, Easter 2021. The women are confronted by two men. They're afraid. They're terrified. Their faces are down. And here's the question in 24, verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? There's the question. What are you looking for? Why are you seeking him here? For all the world religions, the major world religions, if you want to connect with the founder or the leader of that religion, what do you do? You go to their shrine. You go to the monument set up to their life. You read their right, you reflect on their life that they lived long ago. But if you try to connect with Jesus that way, you'll never really encounter him. It's like looking for the living among the dead. Years ago, my wife and I had the chance to travel to Israel, and it was just a remarkable trip. I've talked about it before. All the things I had read about and preached about came to life in a new way, seeing the land. And among the many amazing sights was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Some of you may know about this. It's the church, massive stone structure built over the site of what they believe to be archaeological. They debate this, but the site of Golgotha, the crucifixion, and the site of 
his graveside. So this is inside the church. That's a church inside a church. Those are all people holding candles at, uh, at Good Friday service, pilgrims there. And it's inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So you see how massive this is. That's the shrine over what they believe was his grave. And again, there's debate of whether it's a garden tomb or there. But... And when we were there, it was similar. It wasn't Good Friday, but there were people all around waiting in line to get inside and look at, have a look at this stone hole in the ground they thought might have been his, his tomb. And while their devotion was touching to a degree... I found myself wanting to say, Luke 24, 5, what are you looking for? Why do you look for the living among the dead? What is it you're looking for? And what do you hope to find? When you go to visit the graveside of a loved one, recently I did a funeral for the mother of a a dear friend who's, she was buried at Lincoln National Cemetery. Some of you may have been there. If you've been there, you've seen just acres of white crosses. And we did her memorial service and then they drove to visit the site of of his wife's father, who's also buried in that cemetery. What are you doing when you do that, when you visit a graveside? You're not encountering that person. You're connecting with their memory. It can be moving and meaningful, but you're not encountering them. They're not there. Jesus is not a savior that we remember and feel inspired by once a year when we put on our Easter dresses and ties and show up. He's a living, living, risen savior and king. And this brings us to a shocking statement. Those angels ask the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then they follow it up with a statement that sounds so familiar to us, we can lose the power of it. The next sentence, verse 6, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you? Just as he said he would. Friends, this is the central claim of Christianity. In his book, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel said, even as an atheist, I knew one thing about Christianity. It rises or falls on the resurrection. Easter is the whole ball game. Everything hangs on the resurrection. If it's true, then everything is changed. If it isn't true, you're wasting your time. Christianity is not fundamentally a philosophy to follow or rules to obey or intellectual things that you ascribe to. It's not good advice. Christianity is good news. God has done something in human history. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. It couldn't be any clearer than this, actually. Verses 14 through 17, about the significance of this message. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. That's a sobering thing for a preacher to read. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Could it be clearer than that? Everything hangs on the resurrection. Everything. It's the whole deal. In fact, if it's not true, if he did not really rise from the dead, then you should choose a different religion. There are easier ones. Or make up your own. That'd be fine. Because it doesn't matter. We're playing a game here. I mean, our culture doesn't doesn't like facts these days, if you think about it. Christianity is, is essentially a fact of history. It's not advice. But our culture doesn't deal well with facts. We we deal more with likes and dislikes, like Facebook. I like this, I don't like this. You know, thumbs up and thumbs down, little icons. We approach the gospel that way. Oh, mercy, forgiveness, love, thumbs up. Yes, I double like that. Oh, wait a minute, self-sacrifice, taking up my cross, dying to myself? I'm not so sure. I think I'm going to give that a thumbs down. I'm going to unfriend you, right? That's not how it works. If Jesus has been raised, then he has rightful claim over your life. And if he hasn't been raised, then it doesn't matter. Years ago, a man whose ex-wife was bringing his children to our church, he wanted to know what his wife was getting his kids into. So he made an appointment to meet with me over coffee. I thought, this is going to be an interesting meeting. And so we sat down, and he said, look, I've done some research on your church. I thought, oh, okay. And he said, "Um, I like what you're doing in the community. I love that you're outward facing and you're caring for people. That's really great. But we don't, my kids don't need all the supernatural stuff. I said, oh, what do you mean? You know, all the miracles. Like, take the resurrection, he said. I said, okay, well, tell me about about the resurrection. (laughs) He said, I think it's a great story about good triumphing over evil. But it's ridiculous to think it actually happened. 
And I told him, as I'm saying to you, if it didn't actually happen, this whole thing is ridiculous. It has no meaning unless it actually happened. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Everything hangs on the resurrection. Recently, I came across a, um, a Gallup poll. Perhaps you've seen this. It's recently out. It's getting a lot of attention, lots of stories written about this. That for the first time since Gallup has been tracking this in, Amer- in, in American life, those who identify as members of a church is below 50% in our culture. It's for the first time since they've been tracking, it's dropped below 50%. Actually, members of a church, synagogue, or mosque. And some are saying this is great news for celebration. The secularists are saying, good, let's leave that, that superstitious religion behind and move on and make a better world on, in our own strength. Others are wringing their hands, oh no, or, uh, is, it the, is it the end of, of Christianity or something? I think many in that category have rejected institutional religion. But fundamentally, Christianity is not an institutional religion. It's the proclamation that somebody was raised from the dead. That a man died in your place for your sin. And that God raised him from the dead. That he ascended to heaven. That he right now sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. And that he will return to restore all things. That's the message. If that isn't true, then reject it. Go your way. But if it is true. If it is. And I I don't know all of you. I know some of you, some of you, are, maybe you're here because Grandma said, can we just go to Easter once? Could you just come to church with me? Maybe that's why you're here. I don't know where you stand with God. I just would just encourage you. Everything hangs on the resurrection. Is it real? Is it true? Did it happen? It's the central theme in every sermon in Acts. If you read through the book of Acts, it's the story of the early church, how the church was born, and the early church, you know, Peter, James, and John, they're preaching these sermons. You know what the subject is? They're one-trick ponies. If you get bored with my sermons, you should have heard those guys. All they ever preached about was one thing. You know what it was? Can you guess? It's not a trick question. The resurrection. It's all they ever talked about. Do you know why? It's, they recognize this is it. We're built on this. This is our only hope. It all holds on this. For all of our modern medical and technological advances, COVID has revealed to us what we already knew. The death rate remains steady at 100%. Only the cross and the empty tomb have ever defeated the grave, conquered it. And that means when the Bible talks about eternal life, it's not talking about some vague thing that's going to happen in some distant future someday. Like, Like the hope of heaven is we all float up to heaven and we get angel wings and wear baby diapers and play harps on a cloud or something. Like that we have this weird idea of what heaven is. That's not the Bible's promise. It's that God's conquering of the grave means his resurrection power can invade your life right now, give you hope and freedom and joy right where you are, and that someday he will return and all that's wrong will be made right of the, with this world. Recreation. Let's be clear, friends. Jesus did not die as your example. He died in your place. And he rose to set you free. So you do not connect with God by trying hard to live a moral, or religious, or righteous life. You come to the Father through faith in the Son who died for you and who rose from the grave. That's it. That's the gospel message. There's so much noise in our culture and, and, and sometimes there's so much going on and I get distracted too. We lose sight of this is it. So we don't have a Savior. We remember and feel inspired by once a year when we show up. But a risen, reigning, living king. And what this means, friends, is that if Jesus really did conquer sin and death and the grave, if it's true, then there's no dark thing in your life that he can't conquer. There's no past shame that you try to hide from everybody else that God can't heal. There's no past wound done to you or that you've done to someone else that he can't forgive. There's no present pain that he can't be with you in the midst of and help you through. There's nothing, there's no person here watching online or in this room that God can't reach. If he can reach to the grave, he can reach your heart. And he wants to. What you witnessed over here a moment ago, we say, buried with Christ in baptism and risen with him to new life. It's a tangible symbol of what Easter is all about. What the church exists for. This is the meaning of Easter. There's a lot of talk these days about 
What, what's, what's the post-pandemic world going to be like? What's our hope in a post-pandemic world? What's our hope? Is it the economy? Is it education? Is it getting back to normal, whatever normal is going to be? Is it the right p- political people in power? No, it's not. It is and has always has been the same thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our only hope, now and for all eternity. And it's my prayer, I know it's all of our prayer, that you would know his resurrection power. Perhaps you've forgotten, and God wants to remind you. Perhaps you're here, and, and you wrestle with this, and you haven't turned over your life to him. You haven't said, Jesus, you're Lord. You are real and risen and reigning. He wants to reign over your life. People will come to our church sometimes and ask me questions. What does your church believe about this? Or what's your position on this? What do you think about that? And I know what's happening. You know, they've been formed by, their, by our culture and they have particular cultural views and not so much by scripture and they want to know where we stand. And I understand that, but sometimes you know what I want to do? I just want to say, could we just talk about Jesus for a minute? Because could, do you believe that he is who he said he was? Do you believe that he rose from the dead and is reigning? Because if you do believe that, then you're going to have to deal with what he says. But if you don't believe that, then who cares what our church thinks? What are you even asking me for? It doesn't matter. Everything hangs on the resurrection. Your life, my life, and all of history. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, we pause now to acknowledge that what we sometimes lose sight of and sometimes even doubt and are distracted from is true. You, Lord Jesus, are the risen and reigning King. Thank you for the reminder through music and through your word and through the symbol of baptism. That eternal life is not some distant, vague thing we we don't understand, but it's present and available to us right now. That your resurrection power is available in our lives to forgive our sin, to redeem our past, to give us future hope and present purpose. We praise you that you conquered the grave. And we acknowledge and confess to you there's nothing in our lives you can't conquer as, as well. Thank you for loving us this way. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord Jesus, our King, our risen King, our Redeemer and friend. Amen.